I'm Julian Assange. Roger, I'll get you into shape. Editor of WikiLeaks, we've exposed the world's secrets. These documents belong to the United States government. Being attacked by the powerful. The United States strongly condemned. Hey, quit asking questions. We broke the law. Illegally shoot the son of a... For 500 days now, I've been detained without charge. But that hasn't stopped us. Today, we're on a quest for revolutionary ideas that can change the world tomorrow. A furious war over the future of our societies is underway. To most, this war is invisible. On the one side, a network of governments and corporations that spy on everything we do. On the other, the cypherpunks, virtuoso geek activists who make codes and shake public policy. This is the movement which spawned WikiLeaks. I am joined by three cypherpunk friends. From Germany, Andy Muller Magoon. From France, Jeremy Zimmerman. And from the United States, Jake Applebaum. I want to ask them, is the future of the world the future of the internet? So, wait, 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 uh, I would like to agree with you. I think that architecture matters mm -hmm. and that this is uh, central to everything we stand for, mm -hmm. but that this is uh, a message that we have a responsibility to convey to the public Absolutely. because we understand it as hackers, as technicians who, mm. who build the internet every day and play mm. with it. Mm. And um, I think this is why and maybe this is a way to, to, to win the hearts and minds mm -hmm. of the younger generations. I think this is why the, the, the copyright wars mm -hmm. are so essential. Because um, with peer-to-peer -peer technologies since Napster in 99, mm -hmm. people just understood, got it, that by sharing files between individuals, You're you build... You're a criminal. Yeah. No, <laughs> you build better culture. People who practice... That's no, the, you're a criminal. That's the storytelling. No, 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 but no, you no, build no, a, better, no, no. a better culture for, for yourself. Everybody who used the, Napster... Talk the, with, the, uh, let me finish that, The please. history of the human <laughs> race is the, and the history of culture is the history of copying thoughts, exactly, modifying, exactly. and processing them further on. Culture and, is meant to be And if you shared. call it stealing, then you're like on the cynical... We've had in the West since, since like the 1950s, we've had industrial culture. Yeah, but yeah, our uh, culture has become sort of an industrial product. No, wait, yeah, I, I, but, but, but I, I mean, I, I take I your it. thoughts, I, I, I copy your thoughts, yeah. I modify them, I process them further on. If you want we, to copyright and respect here. your thoughts, well... <laughs> we, we are feeding the troll here, because he's playing the devil's advocate, and he's doing yeah. it very good. Yeah. So, I'm yes... Not, someone fighting. has to. <laughs> you're, not, you're not. But, <laughs> yes, in the I mean, political... it's such obvious bullshit. Yeah, it is. It is bullshit. In the political <laughs> storytelling, it is called stealing. But I want to make my point here, that everybody who used Napster back in 99 became a music fan mm. and then went to concerts and became a, a prescriptor telling mm. everybody oh you should listen to those people mm. you should go to that concert and so on mm. so people have had a practical example mm. uh, on how peer-to-peer -peer technology decentralized architecture actually Napster was a bit centralized back in in the mm. time but set the set set the ID of a decentralized architecture. Everybody had a concrete example where a decentralized architecture brought good to society. And when it is about sharing culture, it is exactly the same uh, when it is about sharing knowledge. And sharing of knowledge is what we are talking about when we are talking about rooting around censorship or just about going through the, the political storytelling to, to, to build better democratic system and to, to, to make society better. So we have examples where uh, decentralized services and sharing between individuals makes things better. And the counter example is the devil's advocate you were playing, where an industry comes and says, oh, this is stealing and this is killing everybody, killing artists, killing Hollywood, killing cinema, killing kittens and everything. <laughs> and they have won battles in the past. And now we may be about to win the ACTA battle. And I once again have to disagree with the devil's advocate you've been playing yeah. earlier, is that if we win against ACTA, that has been so far the, the, the greatest example of uh, circumventing of democracy, of sitting on the face of parliaments and international institutions, mm -hmm. sitting on the fac face of public opinion and impose uh, unacceptable measures through the back door, 
if we manage to, to kick that out, then we will set a precedent. Then we will have an opportunity to push for a positive agenda. When we will see, uh, we will say, N -n ACTA is over. Now let's go to something that really goes in the favor of public. And we're working towards that. And mm -hmm. some conservative members of the European mm -hmm. Parliament today now understands it. Mm -hmm. Understand that individuals, when they share things, when they share files without a profit, shouldn't be enforced, shouldn't go to jail, shouldn't be punished. And so I think that if we manage that one, we have a strong case for exposing to the rest of the world that the sharing of knowledge, the sharing information, make things better and that we have to, to promote it and not fight it. And that any uh, uh, attempt, whether it's legislative or from uh, a dictator or from a company, to hurt our ability to share information and share knowledge in a decentralized way must be opposed, period. And we c I think we can build momentum. Uh, what what did that. you think when, when you saw this um, Pippa Sopa, so this big, big debate that occurred uh, about a new legislation proposed in the Congress to um, uh, create sort of financial embargoes and internet blockades uh, on behalf of uh, U US industries? Wikileaks. It was created specifically to attack WikiLeaks and WikiLeaks related or WikiLeaks like things that exist. Yeah, and in, in Congress, it, the blockade against us was specifically mentioned as, a, as an effective tool yep. to, to, pr to promote yeah. legislation. And but, it but was about I, giving this tool to Hollywood. Yeah, but so so we, had, we, had a, we had a big community campaign against it, and eventually Google and Wikipedia and uh, a bunch of others uh, joined that campaign. But I didn't, I didn't go, OK, that's great, we've won that battle. I, that scared the hell out of me. Because I, I saw that Google suddenly saw itself as a political player and not just a distributor. And it felt that tremendous, enormous power um, over Google Congress. Was just, Google was just one bit yeah, of the so power and people Tumblr, position. I think, made more of an impact than Google did. And Tumblr and Wikipedia and mm. tons of individual actions, very small actions you may never have heard of. But there were, there were thousands of them being parallelized, going in the same direction. And that's, again, decentralized. That's decentralized uh, political uh, action, decentralized political movement that we've witnessed. Google may have been the, the biggest actor that you've noticed among the others, but I think it's, well, it's what, more what the Congress, trail. What Congress said that it noticed. Yeah. So <laughs> I, I think one thing that's worth mentioning, I mean, I take a little bit of an issue of what you said earlier. Because you essentially promote the idea of a political vanguard. I mean, I don't think you meant to do that, but you, you did. And I just wanted to stop you right there. Because the peer-to-peer -peer movement is explicitly mm. against a political vanguard. It's the idea that we are all peers and we can share between each other. We may provide different services or we may provide um, different functionality. But I, I was going to quote Ross Anderson earlier. And one, once Ross Anderson said, uh, he, he said to me, when I joined the peer-to-peer -peer movement 50 years ago, <laughs> which I thought was a fantastic opener. He, he, he explained that he wanted to ensure that we never uninvented the printing press. Because, you know, part of the thing here is that as we start to centralize services, as we start to centralize control of information mm -hmm. systems, we actually do start to uninvent the printing press. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In the sense that when, you know, the Encyclopedia Britannica no longer prints books yeah. and they only print CDs, boy, if you don't have a general purpose computer that can read those CDs, you don't have access to that knowledge. Now, in the case of the Encyclopedia Britannica, it doesn't matter because we have the Wikipedia and we have a lot of other material. Uh, ooh, ooh, ooh. But I don't think uh, we're I as mean, a society I, I that we're ready to... You're coughing. I don't, yeah, I don't think we're ready to... I'm, I'm not sure Wikipedia is uh, all the way good uh, uh, compared well, as a encyclop... resource. I mean, I don't trust a single page there that I didn't write myself. Yeah. Actually, because... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but the Encyclopedia Britannica is no different. It's just one source of many. And what matters is yes. verification of the data. All, all I mean mm. to say is that we, mm. we, you know, we, we should not promote this idea of a vanguard because mm. it is very dangerous, mm. right? Just because people understand technology. Well, hey, I'm, I'm not, why? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you. I'm wearing a bit of a vanguard. Mm. Like, I'm not talking about the vanguards. I'm, ju I'm just saying that we have new tools between our, our hands. I mean, we, we were mentioning the printing press. Uh, I, I'm another visionary, uh, maybe mm. less known in the non-French speaking mm. world, a friend of mine called Benjamin Bayard, uh, said the, the printing press uh, taught the people how to read. The internet taught the people how to write. 
for sure. And this is something very new. This is a new ability for everyone to be able to, to write and express itself. Yeah, but, and but of filtering course, is becoming even more important these days. Uh, but, so, but yeah, I but mean, filtering, to filtering but, but, how to filter. But, but filtering yeah. belongs no, I mean, to understanding. Yeah. Uh, of course, oh, of course. Fil uh, yeah. Sure, fine. sure. Because yeah. everybody talks and uh, yeah. many people say bullshit. Yeah. And as Larry Lessig and I'm, I guess so many other teachers will tell you, we, we, we learn people, we, we teach people how to write. Yeah. But when students give their papers, 99 point something percent mm -hmm. of them are, are crap. But nevertheless, we teach them how to write. Mm. And so, of course, people say bullshit on the internet. That's obvious. But to be able to use this ability to, to express yourself in public uh, makes you, over time, more and more uh, constructed in your, in your way of speaking, more and more able to participate in complex discussions. And all the phenomena we're describing are um, built around engineered complexity that we need to, to break down in small parts in order to be able to, to understand and debate it serenely and so on. So it's not about um, a political vanguard. It's about uh, channeling through uh, the, the, the political system this new ability that we all have between our hands to, to express ourselves, to share our thought, to participate in the sharing of knowledge without being a member of a political party, of a, a media company, or, or whatever you needed as a centralized structure in the past to be able to express yourself. I, I want to look at sort of the, the three basic freedoms. So when I interviewed the head of Hezbollah, Hassan Nasrullah, there's a question as to whether Hezbollah had become... Where's that fucking drone strike? <laughs> there was a question... <laughs> What's that up there? Well, he has his own kind of house arrest as well, because he can't, can't leave his secret location. But, I'm um, not sure that I would make that comparison. Please don't make that comparison. You can edit that out, right? No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so there's a question as to whether he Hezbollah... <coughs> Sorry, guys. He was drunk, OK? He had some whiskey. Well, so. whether, whether Hezbollah has the ingredients of a state, so has it actually become a state, and this is something that is mentioned in the US Embassy cables, that Hezbollah has developed its own fiber optic network in, in South Lebanon. <laughs> so it has the three mm. primary ingredients of a state. It has control over armed force within a particular region. It has a communications mm -hmm. infrastructure that it has control over, and it has a financial infrastructure that it has control over. And we can also think about this as some kind of three basic liberties. The liberty of freedom of movement, physical freedom of movement, your ability to travel from one place to another, to not have armed force deployed against you. We can think about the, the liberty of freedom of thought, freedom of communication, which is inherently wrapped up in freedom of thought, inherently wrapped up in, if there is a, a pressure that might, might apply to you, on the privacy of the communication that you're having. Because if there's a threat against you, speaking publicly, the only way to safeguard your right to communicate is to communicate privately. And finally, the liberty of freedom of economic interaction. And this, this the freedom of economic interaction is also coupled, like the freedom of mm -hmm. communication, to the privacy of economic interaction. And so WikiLeaks has suffered from this extraordinary financial blockade, and that's an example of interference in our freedom of economic interaction. Um, so can so one of you speak a, a little bit about, about, about these ideas that have been brewing uh, in the mm. cypherpunk since the 1990s of trying mm. to provide this mm. very important third freedom, which mm. is the freedom of economic interaction? Yeah, but why would you need only three fundamental freedoms? I mean, in my European Charter for Fundamental Rights, there are more. Because I, the, think, the I, think, I think, of most, rights I think of many of these are derivative. More. So from, from the freedom of communication, you can every other freedom becomes known. That's so the freedom it's a to fun read and the freedom to write, for example. So that's the freedom yeah. to speak and the freedom to be able to read and the right to read any book. And it's a freedom of thought because and this communication is privacy. meaningless unless there's freedom of thought. But and privacy obviously, would be contained in freedom of thought because freedom well, of thought means no, it doesn't privacy, get out of the your mind. Privacy becomes mm. important either from a communitarian perspective, which is you need privacy mm. in order to communicate freely and to think freely. Um, or you need it for your economic interaction in some way. So I think these are, are more derivative freedoms, and these 
the first three that I listed are the fundamental freedoms from which other freedoms derive. Well, there is a, a legal definition to fundamental freedom. Yeah, but this is so I, I've, uh, I've read the EU Charter. I can uh, tell you, this is an absolute dog's yeah, breakfast okay, of consensus. Okay, and, and, and the, the lobbies managed to put the intellectual all sorts of crazy, in crazy the, things in the, in the, of, uh, EU think, Charter. Yeah. Do you think there's a point where we can agree on, and that is that the oh, yeah. money system, the economic uh, infrastructure to uh, interchange money totally sucks at the moment. Uh, and even anybody who just has an eBay account will wildly agree with that. Uh, because like what Payball is doing, what the uh, Visa MasterCard are doing is um, actually putting people in a de facto monopoly situation. Um, actually, there was this very interesting thing from the cable salsa that the Russian government tried to uh, negotiate a way that Visa and MasterCard payments from Russian citizens within Russia would have to be processed in Russia, and Visa and MasterCard actually refused it. Yeah, well, said, the, 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 the power of the US Embassy and Visa combined was enough to prevent even Russia from coming up with its own domestic payment card system. Meaning, and meaning that, even, that even payments uh, from Russian citizens within Russian to Russian shops will be processed right. so, uh, so through when, American data centers. So when, when so Putin goes out to buy a Coke... will have jurisdictional control yeah. or at yeah. least... When Putin goes out to buy a Coke, 30 seconds later it is known in Washington, yeah. D.C. So, so, so this... And that, of course, is a very unsatisfying situation. Uh, independent of the fact if I like the US or not. This is just a very central, dangerous thing to have a central place where all payments are stored because it invites de facto to all kinds of usage of that data. Well, the architecture, I mean, one of the fundamental things that cypherpunks re recognize is that the architecture actually defines the political situation. So if mm -hmm. you have a centralized architecture, even if the best people in the world are in control of it, it yeah. tracks assholes. Yeah. And those assholes, do things with that power that the Absolutely. original designers would not do. Yeah. And it's important to know that that goes for like money. Like oil wells in Saudi Arabia, Arabia as well, the curse mm -hmm. of oil. For example, or mm -hmm. in, in Calgary. I mean, it's like, mm -hmm. it's, mm -hmm. you know, no, no matter where we look, we can see, especially with financial systems, that, that uh, effectively, even if the people have the best of intentions, it doesn't matter. I mean, the architecture is the truth. It's true for the internet with regard to communications. The so-called lawful intercept systems, which are a, which is just a nice way of saying spying on people, right? That stuff was built. I well, think that's a euphemism. Lawful interception. Yeah, absolutely. Well, La like, like lawful murder. You've heard about that. The, the drone strikes on American citizens by the U.S. President Obama. Mm -hmm. You know, when he killed Anwar Awlaki's 16-year-old son in in Yemen. That's mm -hmm. a lawful murder. Right, or targeted killing, as they put it, right? So so-called lawful intercept is the same thing. You just put lawful in front of everything, and then all of a sudden, because the state does it, it's legitimate. But it's, in fact, the architecture of the state that allows them to do that at all. Mm -hmm. And it is the architecture of the laws and the architecture of the technology just as the same as it's the architecture of financial systems. And what the cypherpunks wanted to do was to create systems where we could compensate each other in a truly free way where it was not possible to interfere. Like Chaumian mm -hmm. currencies, although I think... You know, you could argue that they're more centralized than is necessary. You know, the idea there is to be able to create anonymous currencies, right? As opposed to Visa and MasterCard, which is a tracking currency. So basically el electronic cash, but without, say, serial numbers on the cash. Or serial numbers that allow you to validate that it's valid currency, but it doesn't allow you to know that you paid no, Andy okay. or, or what the amount was necessarily. It's, it's recreating right? cash in the digital world. Actually, I mean, so, so this is this is a hmm. sort of a basic freedom, a basic liberty that we've had in traditional societies. To we're exchanging items of value, whether they're we had well, this is like an, cash or whether, so to or say unsolved problem of the electronic world right now. This this is this is this is an issue. To, isn't it? The, yeah, the, the, absolutely. In, in our traditional absolutely. world, in our traditional world, yeah. we have had to a degree freedom of movement, not yeah. so great in some cases, but what we have had. Are you sure, Julian? I feel like your freedom of movement is a classic example of how free well, we really going, are. Well, no, they're going to put, the UK has announced it's going to put 100,000 people per year in my condition. Mm -hmm. 100,000 per year. Mm -hmm. so, so I think that is collapsing to a degree. There's a reason my country shot up people from this country. You know, I mean, there's a reason we shot the British. Yeah, but Boston, and it still exists today. Yeah, but, you know, but, the, you know the, the tyranny, the tyranny that exists. What your country does currently <laughs> is privatizing <laughs> prisons and British, guaranteeing, I mean, guaranteeing by contracts the private companies running 
former U.S. government prisons a specific 90% at least filling rate. Yeah, so this so is... So that this, is like... No, there's more, there's more people like, in U.S. prisons now than there were in the Soviet Union. I mean, that is like... Uh, yeah, well, what is that? That is like uh, I, capitalism I, no, as absurd as it can get. But the, this but, is the fallacy. Uh, uh, this is this fallacy where because I mm. object to something that is wrong, you can suggest that I am part of something that is no, no, equally no, no, wrong. No, 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 come on. And, and I'm not suggesting that the United States is perfect. <laughs> I think the United States is actually pretty great in a lot of ways, but mm -hmm. specifically with regard to the founding fathers' rhetoric, right? I mean, mm -hmm. well, the, the founding fathers' rhetoric I mean, is, being, is, is, is in, in clear dissolution the past ten years. Well, mm -hmm. I mean, yes, of course. I, all I mean to say by my comment about uh, about British tyranny and the situation that you, the, the you <laughs> find agree. yourself in, right, is, is, mm. is just that this is actually a cultural thing. This is where the society comes in and where society is, is, is very important. And technology, for example, it's very difficult for the technology to supplant that. And with financial issues, it is the most dangerous thing to be working on. I mean, mm. the, there's a reason mm. that the person that created Bitcoin did so anonymously. You do not want to be the person that invents the first really successful electronic currency. Well, the guy who did e-gold ended up being prosecuted. Hmm. I mean, it's so incredibly frustrating, right? Because in a sense, this... I mean, I, but but I, I think we should define these bits. So I want to go, go yeah. back to these, these three fundamental freedoms. Freedom of communication, freedom of movement, and freedom of economic interaction. So if we look at the transition of our global society onto the internet... When we made that transition, the freedom of personal movement is unchanged, essentially. The, the freedom of communication is enhanced tremendously in some ways, in that we now can communicate to many more people. On the other hand, it is also tremendously degraded because there is no privacy anymore, and so our communications can be spied on and are spied on and stored, and as a result can be used against us. And so that elementary interaction that we have with people in physically... Privacy is it, available, it is, but it degraded. comes at a cost. Yeah. yeah, so in this sort of militarization of these mm. sort of interactions. And our economic interactions have had suffered precisely the same consequences. Well, the, but so so we're, the loss of privacy for your mm. in traditional economic interaction, who knows about it? Well, the people who saw you, but, go, but people who saw you go down to the market. Now, who knows about your intera economic interaction? If you buy with your Visa card something from your next-door neighbour which you could have done in a traditional market society, almost completely privacy, privately. Who knows about it now? Well, everybody Everybody knows about it. The data sharing between all the major Western yes, powers, they, they all know about it and they store it forever. Julian, it's not wrong what you're saying, but I'm not sure you can really distinguish between point two and three. Uh, because the Internet, as we have it today, is infrastructure for our social our economic, our cultural, our political, or our things. Certainly, so for freedom however, of movement. however, the communication architecture is the money is just bits. I mean, this is just a usage of the internet. So, the, if the economic system is based on the electronic infrastructure, the architecture of the electric infrastructure says something: how the money flow is going, how it's being controlled, how it's being centralized, and so on. So, you're saying so, if, if so we have privacy, very, so in a way, in a way the internet, yeah, I mean, if we if, had an anonymity of communication, we had privacy of communication. You're yeah, saying that we need to we need to reestablish that. We need to reestablish that. I mean, everything has been thrown on the internet. The internet maybe was not even thought for that in the first days, but like the economic, you know. Companies said, well, it's more cheap to do it over the internet. Uh, the internet, the credit card companies, they previously had the ATM machines out there, had like X25 interfaces. So that was a separate network 10, 20 years ago. Now it's all TCP IP because it's cheaper. Well, maybe um, X25 was separate for some people. <laughs> how, 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 separate, how separate was it for you? Well, okay, okay. <laughs> we'll talk about X25 <laughs> when the cameras are out. But, um, it still exists, by the way. But um, <laughs> what I'm saying is just that the architectural thing of the technology is becoming a key issue because it affects all the other areas. And that's what we need to actually rethink, meaning that if we want a decentral economic way of handling our payments, well, we need to take the infrastructure in our hands, right? So. Well, the big failing of Bitcoin, which is, you know... Bitcoin, so what is Bitcoin? Bitcoin is essentially an electronic currency which... Uh, 
in it, it, it attempts to do it in, in, a, in a decentralized manner. So instead mm -hmm. of having the Federal Reserve, mm -hmm. you have a bunch of people all across the world that together agree on what reality is and what mm -hmm. the current mm -hmm. currency is. And, and, and there's some computer programs that help facilitate it. And, yeah, and there's computer programs that help facilitate it. I want to explain it in a non-technical manner. So just, you know, simply mm -hmm. what I'll say is that it mm -hmm. is an electronic currency, which is more, in fact, like a commodity than like a currency. And that people do determine how many euros mm -hmm. it is to one Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a little bit like gold in this regard. And there's, you know, a cost of so-called mining of the Bitcoins, mm -hmm. where you like do a search on a computer to find a Bitcoin. And the idea is that there's this computational complexity and it's tied to the value of the thing. So, you know, in non-technical terms, what you could say is it's a way for me to send you currency and for you to confirm it without Andy really being able to interfere or to stop. Mm -hmm. There are some problems, though. It's not actually an anonymous currency. So this is actually a really bad thing, in my opinion. Now, there but anyone could create an account. So, so it's this interesting hybrid where yeah, everything all, all, is tra all yeah. transactions are public, mm -hmm. completely auditable by everyone. Yeah. Uh, but um, who has created an account uh, is not public. Well, interestingly, if the mm. people that had created Bitcoin had made it mandatory to use Tor, they would have been able. It's, so you don't create an account. You create, you know, some cryptographic identifiers. It would have been possible if everything went over Tor as a core design that you did have location anonymity, even if you had long-term identifiers that identified you that could could link your transactions together. And so it's important to define. So, so this, anyway, this this, this 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 is an attempt to provide anonymous currency. But anyway, how is this? So Just well, an electronic wait, 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 currency, wait, 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 not an anonymous currency. How's the okay. attempt? Without entering into the, the technical considerations, I mean, they are of hmm. or interest. Without entering into the technical consideration, we could agree that Bitcoins has excellent concepts, but some flaws. Uh, it, is, it has a deflationist nature, because money tends yeah. to disappear from, from Bitcoin. Yeah. Uh, so it, it cannot work in the long run, but it sets... Uh, concepts that can be improved. It is maybe well, version 0 0.7 yeah, or 0 I mean, 0.8. So David, this no. is like David Chom reinvented, right? I mean, David mm. Chom's work on... Did he, but, but what, I mean, there's been many Did attempts, there's been many attempts over the past 15 years to introduce anonymous digital currency. Well, Bitcoin was the most successful one of the, the last 10 got, years, I would it say. It got the balance almost right. And, yeah, and, and also, and also because... Visa and MasterCard. I mean, the, the, the okay, problem yeah. is that, that the privacy <laughs> concerns are, are wrong, but let's, let's be honest here, right? Yeah. Electronic currencies are that. And also, let's talk about, you, 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 you sort of conflated something, which I think is wrong to conflate. You suggest that the economics of the situation are different with the internet mm -hmm. than without the internet. You know, when I came here and I bought British pounds, I had to give up my social security number, which is my unique identifier in, mm -hmm. in the United States. I had to give up my name. I had to link it to a bank account. I had to give them the money. They reported all the serial numbers and then they took all that information wow. and they report that to the federal government to buy a, you know, anywhere from mm -hmm. one British pound to a thousand British pounds or more, right? So that's the analog You world. went to the wrong place. You gotta go to the Turkish areas. Yeah, well, yeah. Indian no. ones. Yeah. I mean, I mean they're, <laughs> You know, it's it's different in the United States. So it's, it's actually hard to get foreign currencies because we're so far away from everywhere, everywhere else. Mm -hmm. But but the, the thing I wanted to, to say is that it is his, there's a historical trend of control with regard to currency. It is not just regard to the internet that we see this control. In fact, there are, to my understanding, ATM machines and banks that record the serial numbers of cash and then track them to do flow analysis on the cash and where it's spent and who has done stuff with it. So if we look at those systems and then we look at the internet, the natural progression is that they did not improve the privacy mm -hmm. as we migrated to the internet. In fact, they kept it as bad as it was to begin with. Mm -hmm. And, and in, in, in this way, I think it's very important to then look at the trends from the world before the internet to see where we're headed. And, and what we find is that if you have a lot of money, you can pay a premium to keep your privacy. And if you don't have a lot of money, you almost certainly have no right. privacy. And so it's the same with the internet. It's worse with the internet. Mm. Something like Bitcoin is a step in the right direction because when combined with an anonymous communications channel like Tor, for example, that allows you to actually send, uh, I could send you know, WikiLeaks a Bitcoin over Tor and then you know, anyone watching this transaction would see a Tor user send a Bitcoin and now you have you know, received this. It's possible to do that. That's much better in some ways than 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 uh, and, mailing uh, cash. Uh, Andy, know? can you <clears throat> compare? This is something I've thought about. That mm -hmm. we all speak about the privacy of communication and the, the right to publish, mm -hmm. um, and that's something that is quite easy to understand. Has a long history, and in fact, journalists love to talk about it because they're protecting their own interests. Mm -hmm. 
But if we actually look, if we compare that value to the value of the privacy and freedom of economic interaction, actually, when every, t every time we see an economic interaction, mm -hmm. or every time a, the CIA sees an economic interaction, they mm -hmm. can see it's this party from this location to this party in this yeah. location, and they have a figure to the value and importance of the interaction. Mm -hmm. So isn't actually the, the freedom or privacy of e economic interactions more important than the, fr the freedom of speech? They're, they're inherently that's, linked. That's, that's a very tough one. They're inherently linked. But actually, Be, because, I think... Because, you know, no, economic I, interactions yeah. really underpin the whole structure of yeah. society. Yeah, but, but actually, I if you... you if you the difference you, between the American and European cypherpunks right here. Yeah. Because most of the American cypherpunks would say that they're exactly the same. Because in a society which has a free market, one would argue that where you put your money is where you are speaking. Where you put your money is where you put your power. Exactly. Yeah. I'm not saying that, that that is right. That's almost but, a might yeah, makes but, right attitude towards towards this, which maybe is not where mm. we want. Maybe we want a socially constrained capitalism, for example. Mm. Yeah, but I'm not sure the, mon the, the guys with the most money always have the best um, arguments uh, in respect to the best thoughts also for minorities or for simply issues that are not about power games of money, but that are just, just if, we just, if we just look from a simple intelligence perspective, you've got a $10 million intelligence budget. You can spy on people's email interactions, or you can have total surveillance of their economic interactions. Well, the point which, is which that... One, that which one would you prefer? Well, these days, what they will do is they will say, OK, we will just force the payment and bankings to use the internet. Um, so we have those. And that's what they did. <laughs> so actually, um, powered by Insys. Yeah. Or so the, the the point is indeed that um, there's no direct. Um, and so actually, if escape we, if, here. If we look at the Amazon, you, 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 you can do things like using Tor to connect uh, to protect your communication. You can encrypt your phone calls. You can uh, do secure messaging. Um, with money, it's a lot more complicated, and we have these things called money laundering laws and so on, and they tell us that, you know, drug and terrorist organizations um, are, like, um, otherwise abusing the, yes, it's, it's one of these, yeah, of the abusing the, the infrastructure to do evil things. Actually, I'd be very interested to have more surveillance companies and government spendings to be uh, transparent uh, on, on these issues. But um, so the question is what do we buy when we provide total anonymity of only the money system? What would happen actually? I think uh, this might uh, lead here and there to interesting areas where people uh, make it themselves a little more easy and say, well, you know, I can raise my voice, I can go to the parliament, but I can also just buy some politicians, um, which would... Um, You're describing the U.S., right? <laughs> it is not no, an, it's, it's not anonymous. <clears throat> I'm not it's sure not this, an is, this is limited, really, to the U.S. You know, in Germany, um, actually, we don't call it um, corruption. We call it uh, foundations uh, that buy paintings from wives painted of politicians and... Uh, so it's like in the art trade or in other areas. So we we have better names for it. Maybe in France you call it um, friendship parties, and other call it hiring it prostitutes. You know, there's. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, uh, but in the U.S. It, it's particular because mm. the the um, the link between the political mm. system and money is so yeah. so tight. Uh, Larry Lessig, mm -hmm. uh, after ten years of working on copyright issues. Mm -hmm. uh, said, well, he didn't really give up, but he said that he gave up mm -hmm. on, on uh, trying to fix copyright because he found out that the problem wasn't mm -hmm. uh, the understanding that politicians had of what would a good copyright policy mm -hmm. be. But the problem was that they were just too much linked to the industrial actors yeah. that were pushing for a bad copyright regime. Yeah. And so he launched this initiative, Change Congress, and so on. And uh, what was the name of this uh, institution that demonstrated that 99.9 something of the votes of the U.S. congressmen were directly aligned with where their campaign funding came from? Mm -hmm. So th there is here a, a real problem. 
I think. Are, are you sure it's a, a pro problem, Jeremy? May, maybe, in fact, it's a good attribute that those industries that are productive, <laughs> those industries that are productive, I think they can <laughs> advocate drinking like <laughs> vodka but, but, or uh, whiskey or whatever. <laughs> Wait, 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 wait. Jeremy, 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 Jeremy. Yeah. Wait, wait. Let's actually see if he can finish this yeah, sentence yeah, without yeah, without yeah, go ahead. cracking up. Go ahead. Troll us, master troll. <laughs> <laughs> Those industries that are productive, that produce wealth, that are uh, produce wealth for the whole society, in fact, because they're productive, they have the money in order to make sure that they continue to be productive, and and that. Random legislation, random back. legislation that comes <clears throat> comes out as a result of political myth making, mm -hmm. uh, isn't constraining their productive activities. And the best way to do that is, in fact, to buy congressmen to take the labour of your productive industry and use it to modify the law to keep the productive nature of your industry going. Wait, wait, I'll get this one. Ready? Oh. Ready? <laughs> wait, no. Ready? <laughs> no. <laughs> wow. Why? There are a couple of reasons, but for one, there's a feedback loop that is extremely negative. So, for example, I believe the largest political uh, campaign donor in the state of California is the uh, prison guards union. <laughs> and part of the reason to do this is because they like to lobby for stronger laws, not because they care about the rule of law, but because it is a job incentive. So if you see that these people are lobbying to create more prisons, to jail more people, to have longer sentences, what is it they are effectively doing? What they're doing is they're using the benefit that they actually receive for the labor that was actually beneficial, arguably, in the first place, in order to expand the monopoly that the state grants to them in what they're allowed to do. So they're just using it for wealth transfer from actual productive industries to industries that are not productive. You could sum it up that way. You could also sum it but, up... But maybe that's just a small component. I mean, you know, you, you always... Or every system is abused. Perhaps these, if you like, free riders that are just involved mm. in wealth transfer. Yeah, uh, perhaps, like those, to... perhaps those are a small element. So I've done in fact, the majority, the majority of the lobbying, the majority of the influence on Congress does actually come from productive industries making sure that the laws continue to permit those productive industries from being productive. But you can measure that very easily, right? Because you can look to see which people wish to promote rent-seeking activities and wish to restrict the freedoms of other people and to restrict their liberties to create a situation in which they themselves could not rise to be where they are today. And when they do those things, <laughs> then you know <laughs> that something has gone wrong and they're just protecting the, the mm. things that they have, that they have yeah. essentially, uh, that they've essentially created through an exploitation, usually by an appeal to emotion where they say, gosh, stop the terrorists, stop the child pornographers, stop the money laundering, mm -hmm. fight the war on drugs. And the thing is that maybe those things are all totally reasonable in the context that they're presented originally. And usually they are, right? Because generally speaking, we think that those things are bad because, in fact, there is a serious component mm -hmm. in each one of them. Well, I'd like to actually get um, back to copyright and give you another example. As we had serious issues when cars came up that, you know, the, those who were running companies... Um, Car companies. No, those who run companies actually transporting passengers with horses actually totally feared that this would, like, you know, kill their business, which um, was true, uh, but maybe it also makes sense, also the poor horses. Um, actually, I had a scene where I was invited to a German movie companies association, and before, actually, my speech, there was a professor from a university in Berlin, and he spoke super polite about the evolution of the human race and the development of culture and that copying thoughts and processing them further on is like the key thing that also like making movies is taking themes and putting them into a copy of, you know, make it better understandable and putting it in a dramaturgic way and so on. And actually, so after his 40 minutes, the moderator brashly disrupted him and said, Okay, so after you, you know, just said that we should legalize theft, so let's say what this guy from the Chaos Computer Club has to say. And I was thinking, wow, what the fuck? I mean, if I'm going to speak out, do, will they let me out here alive, so? <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, some industries just have business cases that is not uh, subject to serving evolution. Okay, this is selfish, sustainable, 
staying on their de-evolutionary drive, making it even more monopolistic. But let me let me let me, let me take, let me take the <coughs> let me take okay. the other extreme. You can answer the other extreme. Let me <laughs> let me take the other extreme. Yeah. So the other extreme mm. is that the actions by legislators are not coupled to the wealth of those people who try to influence their actions. In other words, they're just coupled to the cultural memes that happen to be flowing around. So what people just believe, well, the, that they're not, they're not intrinsically coupled hmm. to whether something is wealth, wealth producing or wealth gaining is perhaps a, a better, uh, more neutral description. Well, when, 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 well when, when, you know, cassette came up, uh, you know, audio tapes came up, also they thought that, like, the record industry is going to die. Yeah, exactly. The opposite happened. The record exactly. industry exploded. Exactly. And you know? that, that's so it. that is like, um, I think you're missing... I mean, okay, the, the question is, what's the policy here? So what's, what's the positive way we could formulate these things? I, I just and wonder, I mean, wonder whether we, we couldn't, in fact, sort of standardise the actual practice in the United States what? and formalise it. So you do simply buy senators. No, 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 no. So, so you actually okay. buy them, and you actually buy votes. Okay, well, 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 no, 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 no. Let's assume let's we have the money. Let's assume let's, we have the money uh, to buy the... Yeah, and it was all open, I and it's high speed. And each, each one goes for an auction. But the weapon industry would still have more money. Each one goes for an auction. So, well, but, because but, it's no, I think but, it wouldn't. We, I think it wouldn't. I actually think the military-industrial complex would be relatively marginalised because their ability to operate behind back doors in a system that is not open to general market bidding is, in fact, higher than other industries. Well, but they have a system of privilege. Well, hold on, I got just it. want to go back to his <laughs> Jeremy, Jeremy. I just want to have uh, the <laughs> privilege to address the clearance answer. thing he just said there, because the, no. the, there's a fundamental yes. inequality but in the system. Not. Yeah, but there's please. A, like, come on, no. no. You've got to yes. talk about the fundamental inequality. I mean, you're the French guy in the room. Come on. <laughs> no, actually, I wanted to, to, to... I mean, that's the important part. I wanted there. to have a take on that on liberal perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, wait, wait, what is that? I mean, when you say liberal in my country, oh, what sorry. you mean is something yeah, no, totally different. Not liberal to your weapon, mean, right? He means communist yeah, like subversive. Economic liberal, anti-monopolistic mm -hmm. liberal kind of perspective. <laughs> mm. When you say, let's let the, the dominant <laughs> actors uh, mm. decide what the policy will be, I can answer you from the perspective of what was the internet in the last 15 years, where innovation was so-called uh, bottom-up where um, mm. uh, new practices emerge out of nothing, where uh, a couple mm. of guys in a garage um, invented a technology that spread like... Uh, for, ne for, nearly, for nearly everything, for, so, for Apple, for, for you, Google, for everything, you, YouTube. For everything, everything that happened on the internet mm. just boomed after being unknown a few months or a few, few years before. So you cannot predict what will be the next innovation and, and the pace of innovation is so fast that it has to, to, to go much faster than the policy making process. So um, when, when you design I have a, policy a law, suggestion. when you design a law <laughs> that has an impact on what the, 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 the market is today, on what the, the, the strength relationship between various companies and actors is today, if you strengthen one that is strong already, you may ban a new entrant to, to, to appear and to be more efficient than it is. Or to, to sum it up... Uh, the market's got to be regulated to be free. No, but yeah, of course you have to fight monopolies and you need to have a, a, a power that is superior to the power of those companies uh, to, to uh, enforce the, the, the bad behaviours. But my point here is that it's, uh, policy has to adapt to society and not the other way around. We have the impression with the copyright wars that um, legislator tries to make the, the whole society change to adapt to a framework that is defined by Hollywood. Say, okay, uh, what you're doing when you're with your new cultural practice is just morally wrong. So if you don't want to stop it, then we'll design legal tools to make you stop doing what you think is good. This is not the way to make good policy. A good policy looks at the, 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 the world and adapts from it in order to, to correct what is wrong and to uh, enable what is good. So I'm convinced that when you enable the, the most powerful industrial actors to decide what policy should be, you don't go that way. Well, there was but a guy... Uh, I'm sorry. No, 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 I mean, I... um, let's, I'm just trying to 
positively uh, get us into thinking what would be a good policy. Uh, what you just formulated is, uh, for me at this stage, a little bit too complicated. I'm trying to simplify a little bit. So um, there is this guy called Heinz von Förster, like the godfather of cabinetics, who once uh, made a set of rules. And one of the rules was always act in a way that you maximize, uh, like you increase the options. So it's like um, always do things like policies, technology, whatever, where you have more, not less options. It's just strategy as well. <clears throat> Possibly, yeah. Um, so the question is, because you mentioned like that the limitation of um, privacy, um, or let's say otherwise, the increase of privacy on money actings might have a negative effect. Um, so we need to uh, uh, think, uh, so, well, the money system right now has a specific logic. And the question is, how do we exclude the money system to take over other areas? Because it has the ability, unlike the communication sector, to affect and totally limit other areas. So if you can hire contract killers um, to do specific things, or if you can buy weapons and engage in a war with other countries, um, you are limiting, you're you're limiting other people's uh, ability to piss you off. Well, it's also the ability to limit other people's uh, option to live, to act, to do whatever. That's the same yeah, as communications that, if, if a lot of people well, are pissed uh, off. No, no, that's the same as communications networks, though, right? And, wait, and I think wait a second. I mean, if I put more money in communications, then more people have more options. If I put no, no, more weapons on the market, to surveil them more, you no, have no, more I want to restrict your 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 weapon market. So. I sure, want, and you want, want to restrict like my to. ability to sell that. How do you do that? You, how do you restrict my ability to transfer wealth also through communications no. networks? Listen, the, the, the thing about the, the bailouts in the United States, mm -hmm. it, it's not that the, the, the bailouts, you know, I mean, the bailouts were offensive for a whole bunch of reasons to many people, but mm -hmm. one of the most offensive things is that it showed that wealth was just a series of bits yeah. in a computer system, yeah, and yeah. some people with their begging in a very effective way allowed many of the high bits to be set. Yeah. And then what is the question? Why is there value in the system if you can just cheat the system and get your bits mm. set high, and then everybody else who's struggling to you get mean, along doesn't so, even get to be acknowledged as even having bits that are worth flipping in the first place. So yeah. what you're saying is we need a totally different economic system. Because I mean, no, value... I, I'm saying that uh, I'm saying that there is an economic value. Creating things of value is not today attached to economic value. No, I'm well, saying I mean, something. You, I'm you, saying could, like, you could do bad things and generate money with it, and you can generate good things, and you will not get a cent. Well, no. What I'm saying is that you can't decouple the economy from communication. I'm not talking about whether or not we need a different economic system. I'm not an <laughs> economist, and you know, I'm not even going to front a slight bit about that. Okay. I'm just going to say that there's some value in the communication systems and in the freedom of those communications just as in there is value in freedom of economic actual you know bartering whether it's like I can have the right to give you something in exchange for your labor just as it, I have the right to explain an idea and you have the right to tell me you know what you think of my idea mm -hmm. and and we can't say that the economic that the economic system exists in some kind of vacuum the communication system is directly tied together with this and and, and this is part of society and in fact this is I, I think tied to this if we're going to have this sort of reductionist uh, free freedom notion the, of the three freedoms you mentioned. This is obviously tied to freedom of movement, right? Like you cannot even buy a plane ticket now without using a trackable currency, essentially. Otherwise, you're flagged, right? If you walk into an airport and you try to buy a ticket on the same day with cash, you're flagged. You get extra security searches. You cannot fly without I identification. And if you were to be so uh, unlucky as to buy your plane ticket with a credit card, they'll log everything about you, from your IP address to your browser. I mean, I, I actually have the Freedom of Information Act data for my Immigration Customs Enforcement from a couple of years ago, because I thought someday maybe, you know, it would be interesting to look at the differences. And so I caught it, and it sure enough has uh, Roger, actually, his credit card number, his address where he was when he bought me a plane ticket for some work thing, um, the browser that he used, and everything about that plane ticket was all, all put together. And that went to the U.S. government. It wasn't just kept in the, in the commercial processor. Right. So the commercial data was collected, mm -hmm. sent to the government, and they were tied together. And the crazy thing here, or the thing that I find to be really crazy, is that it's, actually the, it's essentially the merging of these three things you're talking about, right? It was my right to travel freely, 
It was my ability to buy that plane ticket or for someone else to purchase that plane ticket. And it was the ability for me, uh, I mean, effectively to be able to, to speak. I was going to, to travel to speak somewhere. And in order to do that, I essentially had to make compromises in the other two spheres. And it impacts my ability to do that, in fact. Mm -hmm. Especially when I find out later that that is what they have collected and can, that they can, put it together. And can you speak about a little bit about this uh, detainment that you've had at, at U.S. airports and why that has occurred? Well, I mean, you know, they've asserted that that that, uh, that it occurs because I know why. Well, it's very simple because. <laughs> but but they don't they don't say. Can, can I, I mean, it's can, can, can I, I mean, try to summarize it because <laughs> oh, this technical is be rich. because technical security. <laughs> And the security of governmental affairs is two things that are totally detached. You can have a totally secure technical system and the government will think it's no good because they think security is when they can look into it, when they can control it, so when they can breach the technical security. Mm. So this was not about him trying to approach planes to kidnap them, to kill anybody, to hijack the plane or whatever. Oh, this was, no, this th was about his ability to affect governmental affairs by traveling to other countries, speaking to people, spreading ideas, which is the most dangerous thing that happens to governments these days, well, that people have better ideas than what their policy is. So I totally appreciate your complimentary nature in that <laughs> statement, but I just would like to point out, actually, this is way worse than that, because you see, this is the data they collect on everyone. And this was before I did anything interesting at all. It was merely the fact that I was traveling and the systems themselves, the oh, architecture, this is, this promoted this information collection. This mm. is before I was ever stopped for anything. It was before mm. I was deported from Lebanon. It was before mm. the U.S. government took a special interest well, in me Maybe or they anything. forecasted it. Maybe they saw it earlier of, than you did. Of yeah. course they did, right? <laughs> Par partially because of collecting this data. And, but, mm. you know, to, to speak to your point about what it is like, mm. I mean, mm. depending on when. You know, they always give me different answers. But usually they say, one response, which is, I mean, uniformly across the board, they say, because we can. <laughs> and I say, okay, I do not dispute your authority. Well, I do dispute your authority. I do not dispute it now. I merely <laughs> wish to know why this is happening to me. Now, I, I mean, people tell me all the time, well, isn't it obvious? You work on tour. Uh, you're sitting next to Julian. What did you expect? Right? I mean, for example, I've had people mm. literally tell me, what did you expect for, for mm. associating with people like this? And, and, and it's, it's fascinating to me because mm. each of the different people, essentially, it, you usually in the Customs and Border Protection and Immigration and Customs Enforcement in the United States, usually those groups of people that are holding me will tell me it is because they have the authority to do so more than anything else. I've also had them tell me bullshit like, oh, remember 9-11? That's why. Or because we want you to answer some questions and this is the place where you have the least amount of rights, we assert. And... I mean, the stuff that they do in this, you know, in this situation, they deny access to a lawyer, they'll deny access to a bathroom, but they'll give you water, right? They'll give you something to drink in order, like a diuretic, mm -hmm. in order to convince you that you really want to cooperate in some way. Mm -hmm. they, they did this to pressure for political reasons. They asked me questions about how I feel about the Iraq war, how I feel about the Afghani war. Um, you know, basically, at all of these steps of the way, they repeated mm -hmm. the tactics of the FBI during COINTELPRO, for example, where they specifically tried to assert through their authority, their authority to change political realities in my own life and to, and to try to pressure me not only to change them, but to give them some special access to what's going on in my head. Okay, and they've seized my property. I'm not, even, I, I'm, you know, I'm not even really at liberty to discuss all of the things that have occurred to me because it, it's a very uh, murky gray area where I don't even know really whether or not um, all of the things that have happened to me, if I'm even allowed to talk about them. Like, I, was, I think I'm the only... I, I mean, I'm sure it has happened to other people, but I've never heard of it happening to them. I was in the Toronto Pearson Airport once while traveling home from an event where I was, I was, I was there visiting my family, and I was traveling back to Seattle, where, where I was living at the time. And they detained me. They put me in the secondary screening and then the tertiary screening, and then finally into a holding cell. And they held me for so long that I when I was finally released, and I went, I missed my flight. But there's a curious thing, which is the, these pre-detention areas are actually technically U.S. soil on Canadian soil. And so they have a rule, though, that says that if you miss your flight or it's so long before your, the next flight, you have to leave. So I technically got kicked out of America by being detained for so long. And I had to enter Canada, fly across the country, rent a car, and then drive across the border. And when I got to the border, they said, how long have you been in Canada? And I said, well, five hours plus the detainment that happened in Toronto. So I've been in, you know, I've been in Canada about eight hours. 
And they're like, well, come on in. We're going to detain you again. And then they ripped my car <laughs> apart, and they took my computer apart, and then, you know, they looked through all this stuff. And, and you know, and then they, they held me. They gave me access to a bathroom within half an hour. You know, they were very, they were very uh, merciful, you could say. And, and this is this, this kind of, you know, they call it the border search exception. This kind of behavior is because they have the ability, they assert, to do this. And no one challenges them about it. So, so, this, so this, has hap this has happened to you. But Chinese people I speak to, uh, when they speak about the Great Firewall of China, mm -hmm. in the West we talk about this in terms of censorship, and that it's, it's blocking Chinese citizens from coming out and reading what is said about the Chinese government in the West and by Chinese dissidents and by the Falun Gong and so on and by the BBC, and, and, and to be fair, actual propaganda about China. Um, but their concern is actually not about censorship. Their concern is that in order to have internet censorship, there must also be internet surveillance. In order to check what someone is looking at, to see whether it is permitted or denied, mm -hmm. you must be seeing it, and therefore if you're seeing it, you can record it all. And so this has had a, a tremendous chilling effect on mm -hmm. Chinese. Not that they're being censored, but every, everything that they read is being spied upon and recorded. In fact, that's mm -hmm. true for all of us. So this is something that modifies, when people are aware of it, mm -hmm. it modifies their behaviour and they become less resolute uh, in complaining about various kinds of authorities. And that's the wrong in, in answer, way? though. That's the wrong in answer way, to yeah. that type of influence. I mean, their <laughs> harassment of me at borders, for example, is not unique. In that, you know, every Arab American since September 11th and before has had to deal with this. It's just that I refuse to let the privilege of having white skin and a U.S. passport go to waste in this. And I refuse to be silent about it because the things that they are doing are wrong and the power that they are using, they are abusing. And we must stand up to those things just in the same way that there are brave there are brave people in China that stand up to this, like Isaac Mao, for example. You know, he has been working, I think, very strongly against this type of, uh, of censorship, effectively. Because the right answer is not, is not to just give in to this type of pressure, merely because the government asserts it has the ability to do this. But, but I mean, I, 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 Jeremy, why not? I mean, pe I, people, no, I mean, people have to live their lives. I, if there's pressure, they should respond, shouldn't they? But w once again, we're, we're talking politics. Because what you say is basically that people should stand for their right, but people should understand why to do so, and then have the the, the, the ability to, to communicate between each other and do so. Uh, if you, I had the occasion to talk with some people from China, and I don't know if they were um, at some position in the, the, um, in the state or if they were um, selected <coughs> for something in order to be able to, 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 to go outside and talk to me. But when talking to them about internet censorship, I very often had this answer that, well, it's, it's for the good of the people. There is censorship, yes, because if there wasn't censorship, then there would be uh, extremist behaviors. Uh, there would be uh, things that we would, would all dislike. And so the government is taking those measures in order to make sure that everything goes well. That's the same argument for our organ harvesting. Don't let those organs and, go to waste. And, mm. and so then... I, if, if you look at the way uh, Chinese censorship I is being done, you see on a technical perspective that it's one of the most advanced systems existing in the world. Absolutely. And, and I've heard that on, on Weibo, that is the, the equivalent of Twitter, the government has the ability to, to filter some, some hashtags. Uh, oh, maybe you we can just... Some the, uh, we want some air. Yeah. I think this is yeah. getting too so hot like because of your lighting. Oh, yeah. yeah. You forgot yeah. that human uh, beings also give us heat. Do you want a beer, Jeremy? Huh? Do you want a beer? Oh, I'm thirsty, therefore I'm drinking whiskey, so it's not a very good... Uh, <laughs> I mean, I think, you know, it's important to remember that when people talk about censorship in, 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 in Asia, they like to talk about it in terms of the othering. And it's very important to note that when you search on Google in the United States, they say that they've admitted, they have omitted search results because of legal requirements. I mean, there is a difference between the two, both in how they're implemented and, of course, in the social reality of the, the how, the why, the, 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 the where, even. You know, a big part of that actually is the architecture, for example, of the American internet. It's very decentralized. It's very hard to do the Chinese 
the Chinese style censorship in the same in the same respect. And you know, I well, think a big chunk of it is Google, and you can censor Google, and Google is. I mean, there's, there's yeah, so a, lo a load of pages that reference WikiLeaks that are, that are censored by Google. Yeah, no doubt. And and this is something that actually, since the index itself is free, it's possible to do a differential analysis it, mm -hmm. yeah. to find out that this in is theory. The case. In theory. In theory, yeah. And I mean, in in practice, I, there are some people that are working on that type of censorship detection by looking at the differences from different perspectives in the world. And I. I, I guess I think that it is. I guess I think that it is important to just to to remember that censorship and surveillance are not issues of other places. And you know, people in the West love to talk about how Iranians and the Chinese and the North Koreans they need anonymity and they need freedom and they need all that stuff. But we don't need it here. And 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 by here, usually they mean in the United States. And it's very important to note that actually it is not just oppressive regimes. Because if you happen to be in the top echelon of any regime, it's not oppressive to you. It, it turns out, right? But I mean, mm. we consider the UK to be a wonderful place. We consider, generally, people think Sweden is a, is a, pretty, a pretty great place. And yet, you can see that when you fall out of favor with the people in power, that you, know, you don't end up in a favorable position. Mm. I mean, but you're still alive, right? So I mean, clearly, that's a symbol that it's a free country still, right? I worked, I worked hard to, to maintain my current but, position. <laughs> But my point is that it's yeah, but, maybe, but maybe we should actually speak about this. I mean, mm. censorship. But Sweden? Inter no, internet censorship in the West. So this is, mm. this is very interesting. I've looked at the UK a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's a, a real phenomenon. So if, if we go back to 1954 and, and we look at the, the great Soviet encyclopedia, that encyclopedia, which was distributed everywhere, mm -hmm. um, sometimes had amendments as p politics changed in the Soviet Union. So in, in 1954, Beria, the head of the, K of the NKVD, died and uh, fell out of political favour. And so his section, which described him in glowing terms, was removed. It was removed by the Encyclopedia Authority, posting out an amendment, which was to be pasted in into all those encyclopedias. And it's extremely obvious. And that is why I'm even mentioning this example. I'm mentioning this example because it was so obvious and so detectable that it became part of history, the attempt, where in the United Kingdom we have The Guardian and the other major newspapers ripping out stories from their internet archives without any description, doing it in secret. You go, go to those pages now and you try and find them, for example, on the, the corrupt um, billionaire Nahdi Miauchi and you see page not found, and they're removed from the indexes and so on. <coughs> they so erase history. They erase history. His, mm -hmm. History is not only modified, it's it ceased to have ever have existed. It's undetectable erase, erasure of history in the West. Mm -hmm. And that's just post-publication censorship. The pre-publication censorship is vastly more extensive, and that's about self-censorship. And we've seen that yes. with the cables, working with different partners all over the world, which ones censor out material. I mean, in Der Spiegel, they censored out a paragraph about what Merkel was doing. No, no human rights concern whatsoever, purely political mm. concerns about Merkel. Well, you're right. I mean, the um, point is that our understanding of freedom of information and free flow of information is um, in some way a very radical new concept if you look at planet Earth. I wouldn't say it's much different between Europe and uh, other countries. Well, there is uh, countries who have a democratic framework, which means you can read and understand and maybe even legally fight the censorship infrastructure, but it doesn't mean it's not there. While you will have a hard time trying in Saudi Arabia or, um, well, my experience, or China. My to, experience in the West, it is, just, it is just so much more sophisticated in the, the number yes. of layers of, of indirection and obfuscation yes, as yes. about what is actually happening yes. are there in order to have sort of I deniable mean, censorship. Well, so the, so the, well, the Guardian and, redacts... Um, well, and, and, I mean, uh, Jeremy mentioned the, the pedo-Nazis, which uh, pretty good summarize... We're back to the, the pedo-Nazis again. <laughs> which pretty good <laughs> summarize the German, in one. at least the German or maybe part of the European uh, censoring arguments that was that Germany uh, didn't want any hate speech uh, like content on the internet and of course um, if you tell people you need to restrict the internet because of pedophiles then um, you will be able to do anything also it was in an um, 
internal working paper of the European Parliament about data retention, they also argue about, hey, we should talk more about child pornography, then people will be in favour. Can, can, Andy, can, can you what speak if, to this a little bit, that in, yeah. if we are to censor just one thing on yeah. the internet, say just child pornography, then in order to censor child pornography uh, from, from people reading it, mm. we need to surveil everything that everyone is doing. We need to build that infrastructure, we need to build that system, we need well, to build the, a bulk spying the, and censorship the system German to censor pre, just one thing. Well, it's, it's in detail, in the, in the mechanics, it's like this. The so-called pre-censorship system in Germany obliges you to have uh, naming the legal responsible person for whatever you publish. So if you publish something, be it on a piece of paper or on the internet site, without saying who is um, legally responsible for this content, you already violate the law, roughly. Um, <clears throat> this means that, you know, you put the responsibility attached to it. And now you can, you can discuss, because if someone uh, violates um, uh, the law by distributing, let's say, child porn or hate speech, you could also just say, okay, we, we look at where that guy is locating, and we catch him off, and we put the stuff so out of the net. So we censor the publisher instead of censoring the reader. Yeah. If I look at hate speech issues, there is, you know, sometimes things with private addresses of people and so on that might lead to situations I'm not in favour with. Um, but, 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 and, but Andy, on this, this is, is such, a, such, a, such, a German, such a German thing. I mean, yeah. in, in order to do that, in order to determine <laughs> what's going to be yeah. acceptable and what's not, you have to have a committee. You have to have appointments to the committee. You have to have a process yeah, have, of appointments to the committee. We have all that bullshit. We have all that bullshit. And, and then, I mean, the, and the, then, German, and then the German killings in the Second World War, everything the Nazis did, every property they seized, they gave a receipt, okay? They made clear list. It was all bureaucratic acts. I mean, you can say the Germans killed unjustified a lot of people. That's all true. But they did it in a bureaucratic manner. That's Germany. No, but these, I'm, I'm not, these, these committees, to, these uh, committees if, if you have, yeah. a sen if you have, a, if you have yeah. someone deciding what should be censored and, yeah. and what not, yeah. you have to have two things. First of all, you have to build a technical architecture to do the censorship. You have to build a machine, a, yeah. a nationwide censorship machine. To do it effectively. To do it effectively. Yes, absolutely. And then secondly, you have to have a committee and a bureaucracy to censor. And that, com uh, and that committee, uh, that committee uh, inherently has to be secret. Yeah. Because it's completely useless unless, <laughs> unless, unless it is secret, and therefore you have secret justice. You know what? We have one good uh, principle in Germany, and that is if a, law, if a law, yeah, yeah, if a law is unrealistic to be applied for, then it shouldn't be there. It's like um, if a law doesn't make sense, like if you forbid windmills or whatever, it's like, hey, come on, forget it. Um, so the question is, if our, I mean, we are inspired from the Internet as we know it when it was growing up, from free flow of information in the sense of free, as in unlimited, as in not blocked, not censored, not filtered, um, and flow as in, you know. So the question is, if, if our understanding of free flow of information, if we apply that to planet Earth, and it has been roughly applied to planet Earth, we see, of course, that the governments being affected through it and the way power has been applied and the way censorship has been run, being it pre-censorship, post-censorship, or whatever censorship, um, it all gets in a... Uh, we, we have all learned these complicated conflicts that arise. So the question is, what is our concept of governments or the future of uh, maybe a post-governmental organization type of view. So maybe WikiLeaks is the first or one of the first PGOs also, because I'm not sure governments are the right answer to all the problems on this planet, like environmental issues, like issues of well, human beings. Government, well, the government's wait, 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 not wait, wait, sure wait. either. They're, I mean, they're, <laughs> the, the, the yeah. barrier between what is government and not, I mean, it, it's fuzzed yeah. out now. Uh, uh, before like before we go on that, because I... I, 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 have, a, I have a point about something like okay. five conversations back almost. Mine was <laughs> three conversations. Yeah, Jeremy, okay, Jeremy, you on. start. No, Jeremy. no, you start. You okay. start. So I was just going to say that if we... If we hmm. I mean, effectively, if we talk about this in utopian terms that's what what you're talking about where we don't we don't know exactly what it is well, that we that's, want that's to build from an outer space point of view it's just we, one we conversation to, ago you know for a moment if we I'm think back. i'm yeah 
So, I mean, if, we, if we're talking about it in utopianist terms, we have to actually go back a little bit further. So you asked me about the harassment that I received. You asked, you asked about, you know, about censorship in the West. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I talked earlier about Obama's targeted killing program, which they say is lawful because there is a process. Therefore, mm -hmm. it counts as due process. Well, the secret process. Yeah. Well, so here's the thing. We can also Not tie this back to John Gilmore, right? One of John Gilmore's lawsuits about the, his ability mm -hmm. to travel anonymously in the United States mm -hmm. resulted in the court literally saying, Look, we are going to consult with the law, which is secret. We will read it. And we will find out when we read the secret law whether or not you are allowed to do the thing that you're allowed to do. And they found when they read the secret law that, in fact, he was allowed to do it because it did not restrict him in, the, the, in what the secret law said. He never learned what the secret law was at all. And later, they changed the policies in response to him winning his lawsuit because the secret law, it turns out, was not restrictive enough in this way. And so it really... So they made it more restrictive. Effectively through enabling legislation of the bureaucracy. But it's important to note mm. the targeted assassination program, the harassment that people face at borders, mm. the censorship that we find online, the censorship that corporations perform at the behest of a government or at the behest of a corporation. These things all tie back together. And what it really comes down to is that the state has too much power at each of the places that we see mm. these things come out. This is because the power has concentrated in that area and it has attracted people that abuse it or that push for it for its use. And even if there are sometimes legitimate mm. cases, what we mm. see is that the world may be better off if there was not that centralization, if there was not that tendency towards authoritarianism, and that the West is not in any way special with regard to this. Because it mm. turns out if you have a czar of cybersecurity, well, that's not so different than a czar that is mm. in whatever you know internal security forces of, of, of another nation 50 years ago. I mean, we are building the same kind of authoritarian control structures, which will attract people to abuse them. And that, that's something that we, we try to pretend that it's different in the West. And it is not different in the West because it, there's a continuum of governance, which is authoritarianism and libertarianism. And I don't mean in, the, in, in like the political party in America sense. Sure. But, but in this sense, on that continuum, the United States is very far from the USSR in many, many ways. But it's a lot closer to the USSR than Christiania is in, in the heart of Copenhagen, in Denmark. And it is even further, I think, from, from a, a potential like utopianist world if we, if we went and created a brand new colony on Mars or something. What we might build there, we want to move as far away from totalitarianism and from authoritarianism as we can. And these are failings when we don't have Jeremy. that. <clears throat> Once again, I think the, indeed all those topics are bound together. I'll try to make the link between five conversations ago and three conversations ago and what Andy was just saying. Because when we talk about concentrating power, we once again talk about architecture. Mm -hmm. And when we talk about internet censorship, it is about centralizing the power to determine what people may be able to access or not. And whether it's government censorship or also private-owned censorship, it is undue power. We have this example. Our, our website, laquadrature.net, got censored here in the UK <laughs> by Orange UK for several weeks. Mm. It was among a list of websites that, as a, as a service, Orange was providing to, to forbid to the uh, less than 18 years old. So maybe we mentioned the term child pornography while we were opposing those type of legislations. Or maybe they just disliked us because we oppose uh, their policy against net neutrality. We will never know. But we have a private actor here that as a service was offering to, to, to people to remove the ability to access information on the internet. And I see a major risk here uh, beyond the power we give to either Orange or uh, the government of, of, of China or whatever. Clarification, Is that... clarification. When you say private in the UK, do you mean that they are actually own every line, every fiber connection and everything? Or do they actually use some of the state resources? Do they have a duty it's, of care that comes with... It was on mobile. It was on mobile phone, so... Sure, but I, how are the, the airwaves licensed? I mean, there's no state involvement at all? They have no I duty know, of care? The, the licensing, I mean, but the, 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 the cells... The, but my, my point is, beyond, beyond, beyond this, the architectural issue is also that by censoring the internets, we are making different internets. And lots uh, of little broken internets. Yeah. Uh, Orange UK, uh, when it censors La Quadrature du Net, uh, and, and afterwards, is different from uh, Vodafone, is different from in, what they call internet in China, 
and so on. And precisely the, 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 the very nature of the internet is that it is universal. Is that it is it, it has to be the same internet. They're creating it, a filter it, net. That's what it is. It's a pejorative it, term we should all use. It, it's it's about balkanizing the internet, yeah. transforming one unique universal internet for everyone, where we are all a peer, where we all have the very same capacity to access any content, service, and application, and also the the, the capacity to publish some, where we are all equal universally. They are but transforming we all that. Have the ability to communicate yes. with each other. Wait wait, wait 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 wait. Whoever is they whether it's government or company, they're changing the architecture of the internet from one universal network to a balkanization of small sub-networks. But what we are discussing since the beginning are all global issues, whether we're talking of the, 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 the financial system going awry, whether we're talking of, of corruption, whether we're talking of geopolitics or energy or environment or I don't know. All of these are global problems that mankind is facing today. And we have one, still one global tool between our hands that enables better communication, better sharing of knowledge, better participation in, in political and democratic process. What I feel, what I suspect is that a global universal internet is the only tool we still have between our hands to, to address global those global issues. And this is why this is a central fight that we have to fight and that we all have a responsibility here to, to, to fight. Andy? Well, I totally agree that we need to ensure that the Internet, as understanding as this, in the understanding of a universal network with free flow of information, that we need to uh, actually not only uh, define that uh, very well, but also to name and to those companies and those service providers who provide internet and to provide something they call internet which is you know something totally different um, but i think we have not answered the key question beyond this filtering thing and i want to give you an example of what what i think we need to answer um, some years ago like 10 years ago we uh, made a protest against siemens providing a so-called smart filter software was a client-based thing is it, is it, with a server. Is, is one, one of the biggest telcos in Germany. Also, yes, but also a provider of the Intel software. Yeah, and, um, and uh, they they actually sold this to companies. This filtering system, so that the employees, for example, couldn't know, uh, couldn't uh, look at the sites of the trade unions to inform themselves of of their labor rights and so on. Uh, but also they blocked the CCC site, which made us upset, and they called it criminal content or something, <laughs> which we also brought to legal issue. But at the CBIT, as an exhibition, we actually decided we're going to like make a huge protest meeting and we're going to surround their booths and filter the people coming in and out. And the funny thing was that we announced that to attract as much people as possible on the Internet, on our side, and the people on the booth had no fucking clue because they also used the filter software. So they couldn't read the warning that obviously was out there. Um, so, so, which, which, so which comes fans, back also. You see this I know, recent example for us. I know, because also in, in, in WikiLeaks there was this case that people couldn't, even in the accusation against you, couldn't read the documents and, and Bradley so, Manning. So, yeah, so, 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 so the, the US, US okay. prosecutors. Um, so the well, Pentagon set up a, a filtering system so that any email sent to the Pentagon with the word WikiLeaks in it would be filtered. Yeah. And so the prosecution, in attempting to prosecute the case, of course, was mailing back and forth yeah. about WikiLeaks and didn't receive the email, email replies <laughs> because they had the word WikiLeaks in them. So which, which brings had... us back, wait a second, to, to the really basic question. And the basic question is, is there <laughs> something such as negative affecting affecting information so from a society point of view do we want censored internet because this it's better for society or not and even if we talk about child pornography you could argue saying wait a moment this child pornography uh, like addresses a problem that is abuse of children 
And in order to solve the problem, we need to know the problem. Right. So if you further it provides evidence for the crime. Yeah. Although it, it, uh, it, but, 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 it but, provides I mean, this, a lot of representation of a crime scene that is obviously no, no, degrading. It's obviously uh, degrading to. to it's yeah. a, there's an argument about right. re victimizing. No, no, I mean, I mean, that, that, that would be the most radical approach. But if we talk about Nazis or whatever, I mean, you, you, you still have to Down say we, we're talking about. I mean, we're talking about the, the question that, you know, people who have a family will ask themselves, well, isn't it better for the society to filter the bad things out so that we only are stuck to the good things? Or is that not limiting our ability to view the problems and manage them I and think, handle them I think and the, take care of them? The solution but, is always another one than censorship. When we talk about child pornography, we shouldn't even use the word pornography. It's a representation of crime scenes, of child abuse. Yeah, okay. That's there, there's one thing to, to, to do, is to go to the servers, to disable the servers, to, well, that, to, to right, identify, yeah, okay. identify the people who uploaded mm -hmm. the content yeah. in order to identify the people who produced the content, yeah, who abused correct. the children yeah. in the first place. Mm -hmm. And whenever there is a network just, of people, yeah. a commercial yeah. network and so on, mm -hmm. uh, go and arrest the people. And yeah. when we, we, we pass laws, mm -hmm. and we have one in France, mm -hmm. and the, you have an administrative authority from the Minister of Interior that decides which websites will be uh, blocked access to. Mm -hmm. when, when we decide those laws, we, we, we remove an incentive to the investigative services mm -hmm. to go and find the people who do the bad stuff yeah. by saying, oh, we just removed access to the bad stuff. Like we put a hand yeah. uh, on, on, in front of the eyes of somebody looking yeah. at the problem, therefore we solved the problem. Yeah. So just from that perspective, I think, uh, yeah. I, I, I think it, is, it is enough to describe it like this. Mm -hmm. we, we all agree that we should remove those images from the internet. Bullshit. Mm. I'm sorry. I just I'm squirming over here. It's so frustrating to hear the argument that you're making. I want to throw up, right? Because what you just did is you said I want to use my position of power to assert uh, to assert my authority over other people. I want to erase history. And you know, I mean, maybe I'm an extremist in this case, and in many other cases, I'm sure. But I'm just I'm just going to go out on a limb here. You know, this is actually an example of where erasing history does a disservice. Right? It turns out that with the internet, we learned that there's an epidemic in society of child abuse. That's what we learned with, with, this, with mm -hmm. this child pornography issue. You know, mm -hmm. I think it's better to call it child exploitation. We see evidence of this. Yeah. Covering it up, erasing it, is, I think, a travesty to do that. Because, in fact, you can learn so much mm -hmm. about society as a whole. Mm -hmm. For example, you can learn... And I mean, it's, you know, I'm obviously never going to have a career in politics after I finish this sentence. But I mean, just just to be clear about this, right? I mean, you learn, for example, who is producing it. You learn about the people that are victimized. It is impossible for people to ignore the problem. You it means that, that you have to pay for it. You yeah. have to you you have to you have to start searching out the actual the the the, the cause that creates this, which is the exploiters of the children, which I mean, you know, Ironically, some surveillance technology might be useful here in facial recognition of people, looking at the metadata in the images, erasing that, making sure that we live in a world where it's possible to erase some stuff and not other stuff, creating these administrative bodies for censorship and for policing. That's a slippery slope, which, as we have seen, has turned directly to copyright. It has turned to many other systems. And just because it is a noble cause to go after that, maybe we should not take the easy way out. Maybe, in fact, we should try to solve crimes Maybe, in fact, we should try to help those that are victimized. Maybe, even though there is a cost to that kind of helping, maybe instead of ignoring the problem, we should look at the fact that society as a whole has this big problem and it, and it manifests on the Internet in a particular way. Like, for example, Polaroid, you know, when they built the swinger camera, this instant camera for taking pictures, people started to take abusive pictures with those as well, right? But the answer is not to destroy a medium or to police that medium. It is when you find evidence to prosecute the crimes that the medium has documented. It is not to weaken that medium. It is not to cripple society as a whole over this thing. Because for take for example here, we talk about child pornographers. Let's talk about the police, right? The police on a regular basis in many countries abuse people, right? There are probably more abusive cops on the internet than there are child pornographers on the internet. We almost fact, certainly more. But I mean, certainly. we have document, we know there is a you know, n number of policemen in the world, and we know there's x number of those policemen that have committed ethical violations, usually violent violations. If we look just at the Occupy movement, for example, we see this. Mm. Shall we censor the internet because we know some cops are bad? Shall we cripple the police's ability to do good policing work? Well, there's a, que the question, I mean, there's a question about re-victimization. 
if, if, if there's... Yes, as long as those cops are online, I am your, being re-victimized. Your, 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 ima your image mm. of being beaten by a policeman can say this is re-victimization. I mean, I, I would say that the, mm. the protection of the integrity of history of what actually happened in, a, in our world is more important. The, the, the re-victimization does occur, mm. but nonetheless to set up a regime, a censorship regime, which is capable of removing our chunks of history, means that we cannot address the problem because we can't see what the problem is. Mm. And the, the cops I've worked with in Australia, they're not happy, actually, about, about filtering systems. Mm. Because when people can't see that there's child pornography on the internet, it removes the lobby. It removes a lobby that funds the cops to stop it. Mm -hmm. yeah. The point on which we agree, <laughs> I think is the most important one, is that in the end it's the individual responsibility of the people who do the, 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 the content, the child abuse material and things like that. That really matters and on which uh, cops should work. Right, we don't agree. That's no, not no, what no, I said. No, no, no. No, no. Jeremy's talking about doing, not publishing. There's a difference. Are you, yeah, are you I'm sure talking about you producing. Talking about I'm talking about the production of the content is not the issue, actually. That's, what I'm, that's that, just a minor <clears throat> clarification. If, you, if, for example, you have well, abused a child well, and Andy took a picture of this th as proof, I don't think Andy no, should be the prosecuted. people who abuse right. it's, yeah, it's, but, but some people, and abetting, some people and, abused maybe the child to prove the, uh, the pictures, right? Of course, the, of so, course they do. And, but and I mean, there, the, the, there's just, I mean, there's also an economic thing involved here. Um, uh, so I agree with that entirely. I'm making a distinction here, which is to say that mm. the content itself is a historical record, which is evidence of a crime. It is evidence of a very serious crime, but we must never lose, we should never lose sight of the fact that there, there is re-victimization, but there is the original victimization, and that that is actually the core issue. And whether or not of there course, are pictures of it... Of course, that's what I mean. Yeah. Whether that's or not there I are mean. pictures yeah. is, 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 is almost irrelevant. When there are pictures, it is very important to remember you have to keep your eye on the prize, yeah. right? And the, the goal there is to actually stop the harm stop the abuse, mm -hmm. right? And a big part of that is making sure that there is the evidence and that there is the incentive for the people with the right tools to solve those crimes. Mm. I mean, that, that I think is incredibly important and people really lose sight of that because the easy thing to do is to pretend that it doesn't exist and yeah. then to stop it and say that that has stopped the abuse and yeah, that doesn't. And, mm. and, the, and the trouble is that right now, a lot of people will obviously favor the easy solution because it's very inconvenient to look at the society, uh, what's really going on, and that is, I think that is, I think you do have a chance to get a political situation, because it's not that you're trying to uh, ban um, actually problems, and you're not trying to make a policy that ignores the problems. Okay, and that's what what I mean. In a way, this is cyber politics, maybe, but this is also a question: uh, how a society handles issues and um, I do think that um, I, I, I do have strong doubts there is something such as information that is doing harm directly. It has to do with the ability to filter of course and it's also true I don't want to see all the pictures that are available on the internet. There's some I really find you know, disgusting is distracting but the same is true for the next video store uh, uh, like showing movies that are fictional and ugly. Um, so the question is, do I have the ability to handle what I'm seeing and what I'm processing and what I'm reading? And that is um, uh, the filtering approach. Actually, Wau uh, Holland, the founder of CCC, he said one a funny sentence that was, you know, filtering should be handled in the end user and the in the end device of the end user and the device so of the end user. Should be done by the it people should be who done receive here, it here in the brain and the, yeah. the device of the end user. That's yeah. this thing you have between your ears. So there, where you should filter, and it shouldn't be done by the government on behalf of the people. If the people don't want to see things, well, they don't have to, and you you do have the requirement actually these days to filter a lot of things anyhow. Andy, I, I spoke recently with the president of Tunisia mm -hmm. and I asked him about what was going to happen to the intelligence records of Ben Ali, mm -hmm. so the equivalent to the Stasi archives yeah. of Tunisia. Mm -hmm. And he said that, well, these were very interesting and the <laughs> intelligence agencies, mm -hmm. um, he would have to, they're a problem and they're, they're dangerous and he would uh, have to knock them off one by one. But in relation to these archives, mm. 
uh, he thought it best for the, the cohesion of Tunis Tunisian society that they all be kept secret. So there wasn't a blame game. Can, you were a young man during the fall of the Stasi yeah. in East Germany. Can you speak a little bit about the Stasi archives? And, and what well, do you, Germany what, has, and what do you yeah. think about this yeah. opening up of security archives? Well, the, Germany probably has the, the most well-documented intelligence agency uh, on the planet, or one of those, the, the German, East German Staatssicherheit, um, all the handbooks, procedural papers, training documents, uh, internal studies, internal training, all that documents are roughly public. Roughly means that not all of them are uh, easy to access, but uh, a lot of them are. And uh, the government has created an own agency to um, actually take care of the records. So German citizens also have the right to view their own uh, Stasi files, so if there was anything stored on them. So what, but what has been um, it? So, so the German government created the BSTU, this big Stasi archives file yeah. distributor. Yeah, so and, each, and, so and, 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 journalists, could... and journalists can apply so-called research inquiries, uh, which is maybe comparable to freedom of information requests. Uh, to allow them to study matters, and there's a lot of books and also handbooks of uh, strategic uh, behavioral learnings of how the Stasi applied this and that. Um, <clears throat> actually, um, the, I think um, this is a very good thing to learn from, and that is what the president of Tunisia should consider, that there, he needs to distinguish between two things. The one is personal records, I can understand that it is a bit uh, too much to expect that they publish all the personal records the former intelligence agency has raised, because the, president, the now president will ha have to judge about his own records here, and also those of his allies and so on. So, and they will also, these intelligence agencies don't respect privacy, right? So you will have personal records of your sexual, of your telecommunication, of your money transfers, of everything you have done, uh, which uh, you might not want to have disclosed. If you look at this, did, so, did, you, did you follow the situation with the Amdawa in Egypt? Mm -hmm. So where, where the, mm -hmm. the domestic state security, 100,000 strong people went yeah. in, they looted the, looted the archives yeah. uh, as the, the Amdawa yeah. uh, tried to burn them and destroy them and dump them in the garbage. Mm -hmm. And lots of material came out and was, mm. and was, was spread around the place. You, you could buy mm. records for, for, for $2 in the, yeah. in the local market, well, not, uploaded to... And, well, and not, it hasn't destroyed Egyptian society. Yeah. No, no, but uh, in, in, no, the opposite has obviously happened. No, I'm just saying that I do have a bit of an understanding of people don't want their personal records to be released. I can understand that, okay? If I have, if I was living in a country where 40 years so of intelligence about, you know, was after me, uh, and, and every time I go to the loo or I do something... So there's cost-benefit cost, cost analysis, right? Yeah. I mean, from, right. from, from, my, from my perspective, right. once a rat, always a rat. Right, but the hacker ethics uh, rough argument is, you know, use public information and protect private information. Uh, or data. And I do think that if we are advocating for privacy, and we have good, very good reasons to do so, we shouldn't just say there's a balance of things here. We, we can't distinguish here. It's not that we have to put it all on the public. I mean, uh, the names but, but of... But there's a secrecy that, mm. you know, there's a benefit to that secrecy that has an asymmetry mm. where the people... Okay, l l let's mm. take a step back. Mm. You argue, essentially, uh, from a completely flawed point, which is this notion that mm. data is private when it is limited, essentially. And that's just not true. For example, mm. in my country, if a million people have a security mm. clearance and they're allowed to access that private data... 4.3 right. million. How can you call that data private? All right. Right? That's the problem, right? Is that it is not actually truly 100% secret from every person on the planet. No, no. It is only secret from the people the who... The secret from the powerless and to the powerful there. Yeah, you're, you're exactly, right. Exactly. You're right. Okay, but if we want to open the archive and totally... I mean, what has happened in Germany... So, I mean, it has actually, happened in, in some European yes. countries. No. I don't know a single country where all the records have been disclosed. But, I mean, in a greater extent to Germany. 
record records were that, that in, might in Poland, be. I mean, for example. What, what, what has happened actually, and which is the bad side of this deal Germany has done, is that they used the former officers of the German state security of the Stasi in order to, yes, administer of the Stasi Stasi to administrate not only the Stasi records, but also part of the new Germany, so-called, so as the unification former eastern part. And actually, okay, there's this interesting story that um, there was a company winning the public tender to clean the building where the records were kept. Uh -huh. Yeah. And the company just won the tender because they were the cheapest bidder for the same service than other companies offered. And after just six years, the Stasi, the uh, actually organization keeping the records, found out that they had hired indeed a company built up by the former Eastern intelligence to clean their own records, so to clean the house where the records were. And there was a report and of that on WikiLeaks. Exactly, and and WikiLeaks was it. It was, great. was publishing the record about exactly that. So uh, you are right that uh, once these records are created and they are in the hands of evil people, uh, it is hard to declare privacy. But, but I mean, it's not. We can go to a broader issue though. So. Mm. The, the internet has led to an explosion of the amount of information that is available to the public. Yeah. Extra ex mm -hmm. It's just extraordinary. Educative fu function is extraordinary. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, what is not seen, and people talk about WikiLeaks and they say, there's an, uh, people talk about WikiLeaks and they say, oh look, all that private government information is now public. The government can't keep anything secret, etc. I say this is rubbish. I say that, mm -hmm. that WikiLeaks is the shadow of a shadow. Mm -hmm. In fact, that we have produced over a million words of information and given it to the public mm -hmm. is a function of the amount of secret material, the enormous explosion in secret material. And in fact, powerful groups have such a vast amount of secret material now mm -hmm. um, that it dwarfs the amount of publicly available material. And the operations of WikiLeaks are just a, a, a percentage fraction of this privately held material. So yeah. do, do you think, when you look at the balance mm -hmm. between powerful insiders knowing every credit card transaction in the world, and on the other hand, being able to um, Google and search for the blogs of the world and people's comments, how, how do you see this balance? Well, of course, I could argue that it is good if all these records get disclosed because people will learn that if they use their credit card they leave a trace. So some people, if we explain it to them, they will all find this very, you know, plastic, very un very, you know, hard to understand and very abstract and so on. And they will understand at the moment they read their own records. Actually the but German if, if you get your Facebook record which has what did you say? Yeah, uh, exactly. Like that. Eight hundred eight hundred megabytes I, I know, of information. I know that, about you. that after the like um, fall down of the Eastern Bloc, this German Chancellor Kohl, he wanted to unify Germany and the Americans made a condition within the so-called 2 plus 4 talks and they said they want to still heap, keep uh, uh, the German telecommunication under their control and the surveillance. And um, he was thinking it was not important because he was not understanding what telecommunication surveillance is. And I met someone from his office team and they said they were really upset about this and they finally organized to have like 8,000 papers, uh, 8,000 pages of transcribings of his phone calls the Stasi had made. So they, they rolled in like two like small kettle caddies with all this paperwork into his office and he said, hey, what the fuck is that? It said, oh, that's your phone calls the last 10 years. Also the ones with your girlfriends and your wife and your secretary and so on. And so that's, they, they made him understand what is telecommunication interception. And indeed, uh, these records from this intelligence do help people to understand what the intelligence is doing mm -hmm. and so on. So we could argue for full disclosure, and I wouldn't be sure if we would vote now, I would really oppose it. No, but I, do, I, 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 don't, I, don't but even, I do. I don't even want to talk about no, that no. so much. This, this no, no, there's ob ob obviously there are cases where if you're investigating the mafia during a period of investigation, you should keep the record secret. It's obvious. Yeah. But um, just this, the difference between the power of information collected yeah. by insiders, 4.3 million security clearances now in the yeah. United States, these shadow states of information that are, that are starting to develop and swapping with each other and developing alliances yeah. and connections with each other and into the private sector mm -hmm. and so on, versus 
the increased size of the commons. So the, the, this, the internet is a common tool for humali- humanity to speak to itself. Mm-hmm. And, that, and that increase in power. How, how do you see, Jeremy, the, the battle in these playing out? S- several, several things I note mm-hmm. here. Mm-hmm. This uh, debate about full disclosure makes me think of, uh, was it um, uh, this group known as LOLSEC? That's at some points really 70 million um, mm-hmm. uh, records from, um, was it Sony? All the, the users' data from Sony. Mm-hmm. And you could see all the addresses, uh, email addresses and passwords, and I think there were even credit card details from 70 million users. And as, um, as a fundamental rights activist, I thought, wow, there is something wrong here. If to, to prove your point or to have fun or to whatever, you disclose people's personal data. I was very uncomfortable with seeing those mm. people's email addresses in the record. Mm. And, um, and in a way, I thought, those people were having fun uh, with computer security. And what they were demonstrating is that a company uh, as notorious and powerful as Sony mm. wasn't able to keep its users secret wasn't able to keep the secret secret. And in a way, having those 70 million users search in a search engine for their email address or for their name and find this record would make them instantaneously realize, oh, wow, what did I do when I disclosed those data to, to Sony? Mm. What does it mean to give personal data to but, a company? Can again, I trust a personal... The messenger. If I can just interrupt for a moment. We have, no. we, have, we have five minutes of film left. Well, it does create awareness, which is a good thing. But I thought, that digital, I thought that digital technology <coughs> is enabled for yeah, infinity of information. So, so, so we have... I, I, we, I, we, what the fuck is we, going on? I wanted to pledge something about the about Stasi record. No, no, no. We have five, five minutes left. So, um, so we've gone through all these pessimistic scenarios. So now I want to look at a potential utopian <laughs> scenario, which is we have the radicalization of internet youth, and now that is approaching the majority of youth. Inter- well, internet youth is approaching the majority of youth. Well, the good so so okay, this, yeah. we have that radicalization. Yeah. On the other hand, we have some desperate attempts at anonymization, free and uh, freedom mm-hmm. of public publication, freedom of censorship. We have we have a vast array of state and private sector interactions which are fighting against that. But, mm-hmm. but let's assume that we take the most positive trajectory. What does it look like? I think the right to read and the right to speak freely without exceptions for every single person, not one single human being accepted. Mm. No exceptions whatsoever. I mean, to quote the, essentially to, to, to misquote Bill Hicks, the late Bill Hicks, you know, I mean, he talked about this with regard to education, clothing and food. But that's really what it comes down to. Everyone has the right to read. Everyone has the right to speak freely. In that comes a right to anonymous speech, the ability to, to be able to pay people in a way where there is no interference from third parties, the ability to travel freely, the ability to correct data about yourself that is in systems, to have transparency and accountability for any systems where we cede any sort of agency. Andy? I would add the thought to it that with the increase of information processing systems being around and the network side of it also with the availability of tools like Tor and encryption and so on. Um, The amount of data that can be suppressed is pretty low, meaning that governments need to adjust to that and they know it. They know that acting in secrecy uh, these days just means acting for a matter of time in secrecy. It will be subject to public records sooner or later. And this is a good thing. This changes the way they act. This means they know there Quiet. is accountability. Mm-hmm. This also means they actually force whistleblowing inside processes, like in the Southern Oxley Act, uh, requiring companies which are registered in the U.S. stock rate Uh, to have a whistleblower infrastructure so that people who need to report about uh, criminal or other misbehavior of their superiors have a way to report that without being affected uh, directly by their uh, superiors about that they are reporting. So this is a good thing and this uh, will bring more sustainable processes in the long term. Jeremy? Well, 
adding to, to what Jake just said, I think we must make it clear for everyone that a free, open and universal internet is probably the most important tool that we have to address the global issues that are at stake and that protecting it is probably one of the most essential tasks that our generation has between its hands. And that when somebody somewhere, whether it's a government or a company, restricts some people's ability to access the universal internet, it's the whole internet that is affected. It's the whole of humanity that is being restricted. And that we are witnessing that we can collectively uh, increase the political cost of taking this decision, that we can all of the citizens accessing a free internet um, deter those behaviors, that wait, waiting to find something else, something better than the democratic, uh, the democratic re representative system that we live into, we can... Uh, can I interrupt you, yeah, Jeremy? Yeah, you Which, we have that one. Yeah, you, can, can you come over here? Johnny, you out? I'm out. Yeah. Well, uh, let me just put this one. Oh, no, no. So how many Laura, how many can many you come over here? Yeah, it's about battery or memory? memory? It's just how many memory. How many cards have we got back now? Mm. <laughs> so that, that has definitely been... Yeah, so I was giving that back to me. So, again, yeah. <laughs> Lovely. Jeremy, can you remember where you were in the middle yeah. of your peroration? I'll, I'll, I'll trick you. You were getting, no, no, no. getting back and going we again. Yes. Yeah. Sure I'm going to use alternatives as a sort of important goal for this type of thing because it, we've gone like from really positive to horribly negative. And I think the most important thing for people watching this is there's some 16 year old kid at home that didn't find the rubber hose file system yet. Hmm. And what he needs to know is that he could be the person that is writing that tomorrow. No. But it'll be his version of it for his context, and I think we should really talk about that as a like yeah. a you know it's important to talk about building alternatives. We will, but after, after, we have, we have more time for conclusion now. After okay. after, after Germany, <laughs> we have an idea of how how much time we have. Do we have? Just, you know, just keep going. Okay, that's good, that's good. You know, not for the rest of the night. You, know. so, but you, you can keep on talking. Yeah, we, we could go, yeah, that's What a, he's trying to do is get your vision <coughs> of utopia. No. Well, so, Jeremy, you, you were speaking about the importance of fighting for the, this universal medium that we have, which is the internet, which has become, uh, wait, become our global way to understand global problems <laughs> and each other. We are beginning to see that as network citizens, we have a power to weight in the political decisions and that we can make our elected representatives and our government more accountable for what they do when they take bad decisions that affect of fundamental freedoms and that affect a, a free global universal internet. So I think we should practice that. We should uh, continue to uh, share knowledge about how to do it. We should uh, continue to improve our uh, ways of action, the, the way we, we exchange tactics about going to the, to the parliament, about exposing what the politicians are doing, about exposing the, the influence of industrial lobbyists on the policy making protest, that we should continue to build tools to make citizens more able to build their own uh, decentralized um, encrypted infrastructures, to, to own the communication infrastructure, that we should promote these ideas in the whole of society as a way to build a better world, and that we are beginning to do it. We should just continue. Jake, the, what are the, the, if you look at uh, people like um, Morozov's description uh, of uh, the problems in the internet, Actually, this was shadowed long ago by the cypherpunks, and, and it wasn't a view that one should simply com complain about the uh, burgeoning surveillance state and so on. But in fact, we can, in fact, build the tools of a new bureaucracy. It's a physical thing. We can actually build them with our minds, distribute them to, o to other people, and that technology and science is not neutral. That, in fact, there are particular forms of technology that can... Uh, give us these fundamental rights and freedoms that many people have aspired to for so long. Absolutely. The key thing I think that people should walk away with, especially if there's some 16-year-old or 18-year-old person that wishes they could make the world a better place, the thing they have to know is that nobody sitting here and nobody anywhere in the world was born with the accomplishments that they, that they later have on their, on their grave.
we all build alternatives. Everybody here has built alternatives. And everyone, everyone, especially with the internet, is empowered to do that for the context that, that they exist inside of. And it is not that they have a duty to do it, but it is that if they wish to do this, they can. And if they do that, they will impact many people, especially with regard to the internet. Building those alternatives has an amplification, a magnification, where I think you use... It's not the just for you. If you, if you build something, you can serve it to a billion people. For example, or if you participate in building an anonymity network like the Tor network, for example, if you participate in that, you help to build the alternative of anonymous communication where previously it did not exist. It's about sharing that knowledge, sharing the knowledge freely and mm -hmm. e enabling communication channels for knowledge to, to, to flow free. This is what you're doing. Tor wouldn't be free software it wouldn't be as widely spread as it is today. And it is because we, we embed in the way we, we build alternatives and build technology and build models, we, we embed that notion of, of freedom that we may uh, come up with something. We need free software for a free world, and we need free and open hardware. Uh, by, free, by free, you mean? I mean, unconstrained, people can muck about with the internals, they can see how it operates. Absolutely. I mean, we need software that is as free as laws in a democracy, where everyone is able to study it, to change it, to be able to really understand it, and to ensure that it does what they wish that it would do. Right? Free software, we, we free have hardware. This, they have this notion from cypherpunks that code is law. So on the, internet, from Larry Lessig. What, on the internet, what you can do mm. is defined by what programs are existing, what programs run. And therefore, code is law. Yeah. Absolutely. And what that means is that you can build alternatives, especially in terms of programming, but even in terms of 3D printing or in terms of social uh, things like hackerspaces that exist. You can help to build alternatives. And the key thing is to drive them home into a normalization process, one where people become socially very used to being able to build their own three-dimensional objects, to being able to modify their own software, to knowing that when someone blocks that they don't provide internet access, they provide a filter net or a sensor net, and that in fact they are violating their duty of care. That these, these people, every single one of us, that's what we have done with our lives, and people should know that they have the ability to do that for future generations and for this generation now. I mean, that's what I see, that's why I'm here. Because if I don't support you now in the things that you are going through, what kind of world am I building? What kind of message do I send when I let a bunch of pigs push me around? No way. Never. We have to build and we have to change that. We have to, I mean, as Gandhi said, right, you have to be the change you want to see in the world. But, you know, you have to be the trouble you want to see in the world, too. <laughs> so you've got to do that, right? I mean, it's a softer world. I mean, it's not the same as Gandhi, but I think it's really important to do that. And people need to know that they cannot just sit idly by. They need to actually take action. And hopefully they will. Andy? Well, I think we're seeing a good chance that um, people can proceed further on from where we are and alternatives come from people who are unsatisfied of the situation they find or the options they have. Um, Can you talk a bit about the CCC in this context? I mean, the CCC, well, the CCC is, 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 is mm -hmm. unique in the world actually. Yeah. Well it's it's trying to be a galactic organization well, and we are, we're, we're, all, we're, we're not, we're tell, not tell there me. yet. We're <laughs> still down a little bit on uh, this Andy, planet. Andy, Andy, tell, yeah. What is the CCC? Okay, the CCC is a, um, actually a um, galactic hacker organization who promotes freedom of information, transparency of technology, and cares about the relationship between human and technology development, so society and development interacting with each other. This is just isn't and a little thing. This is actually, actually yeah, well, becoming well, well, political. Well, 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 well. And, 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 the, and the CCC has become like a forum of the hacker scene with a few thousand members uh, based a little bit in Germany, but we don't understand ourselves as living in Germany. We understand ourselves as living in the Internet, um, which is maybe a, a big part of, of uh, self-understanding, which also attracts... I mean, we are very well networked with other hacker groups in France, in America, and, and other why places. Why do you think this is a German phenomenon? Oh, it's not because a phenomenon. I'm no, but not it sure started it's in Germany. The heart is in Germany. It's expanded out to the rest of the world. Is, is yeah, this... well, well, the point is that that Germans always try to structure everything. German so engineering um, is better. And no, but no, I no, think no, it's no, not no, just I mean, that. It's the, it's, it's the fall. It's the it's the it's this Ber well, Berlin, and it's the it's the fall. Well, it has of, to do with, with different things. The one thing is that Germany has done the worst thing uh, a country can do to others. 
So Germany is maybe a bit more immune to doing those uh, things like starting war with other countries, you know, and these, these kind of things, because we've done it all. We've been through it. We have been hardly punished. We had to learn from it. And actually this uh, decentral thinking and anti-fascistic behavior, like avoiding totalitarian state, is teach in German schools still, because we had that at the worst level. And so I think that is part of to understand the CCC, which is a bit of a German phenomena, uh, like Bau Holland, the, the creator who founded it, he was also having a very heavily political uh, like approach to this. I saw his father actually at, at his grave, okay, when his son actually died before him and his father was not saying personal words, he said like, and that there will be never like anything uh, infecting non-peaceful things from German ground again. That was like his father's comment when he bore, brought his son to death. And that was explaining me a lot about why Wow was so heavily on uh, like, like influence and taking care of people acting peaceful with each other and spreading ideas and not limiting and not behaving like aggressive, but like cooperative and these things. And, and the thought of cooperative creating things like open source movements and so on has been indeed infecting and coming together with thoughts of, you know, American cypherpunks and, I mean, Julian Assange WikiLeaks and so on. And this is all like a global thing going on now which does have um, very different, and that is good, very decentral cultural um, attitudes. So Swiss, German, Italian hackers, Italian hackers are totally behaving differently than German hackers are. So they need to make, where everything they are, they need to make good food, where German hackers need to have everything well structured. So yeah, that's no, really, and, and I mean, I, I'm not saying the one is better than the other. I'm just saying that, that each of this very decentral culture has this very beautiful, parts and um, you know at the Italian hacker conference you can go to the kitchen and you will see a wonderful place at the German hacker come you will see a wonderful internet but better don't look at the kitchen yeah. so it's like <laughs> very very different approaches and um, the still the, the heart and the whole thing of it is we're creating and I think we find ourselves in some kind of a common conscious, which is totally away from our national identity, from being Germans or from being Italians or from being Americans or whatever. Uh, we just see we want to solve problems. We want to work together. We see, you know, this internet censorship, this fight from governments against new technology coming up as some kind of um, evolutionary situation which we have to overcome. It's actually we, we, are, we are on the way identifying solutions and not only problems, and that is the good thing. So right now we still have to fight a lot of bullshit probably for the next, I don't know how many years. But now, finally, there's also coming up a generation of politicians who don't see the internet as the enemy, but also understand that it's like a part of the solution and not part of the problem. And um, I mean, still we have a world built on, on weapons, on power, of, on secret keeping, on all that, you know, economic framework and so on. But that is changing. And I do think we are very important um, in the policy making right now. So to discuss also the issues in a controversial way, and that was something that the CCC has managed for a long time. Actually, we are not a homogene group or whatever. We have very different opinions. I appreciate also we sit here together and we don't you know, come with right, the, the, the best answers right away. We just come with questions and we crash our different ideas on the table and, and see what's the bottom line. And so that's the process I think that needs to go on and that's what we need a free internet for. And we need here and there a bit uh, provided by a good infrastructure that is allowing us to also understand what the hell is going on outside. So, the wrap. Very good. Thank you. You cause your other. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. That's the conclusion. I oh, thank you, but I need to go you to the loo it. now. Wait, wait, wait. Take a picture. Oh, sure. oh, exactly. yeah. Yeah. You mean before I make pee pee on the <laughs> sofa? <laughs> you don't give the camera to the director. You know that. <laughs> and can somebody take a, a picture of him taking a picture, please? <laughs> <laughs> That's for my personal record. So, okay. So, okay. So, okay. So, okay.
So just uh, push the button and make sure it's properly exposed. Well, it's certainly as well lit. Should be the other way. Could we have a camera man doing it? Yeah. There we go. Macro. That's good. Certainly won't be allowed back in America with that on your camera. That's for sure. So you got, you know, I mean, uh, combined with go team, it's a very good. Uh, go away. No, stop. Push the button on top of the camera. <laughs> the, just push the button on the top. Push it, and then you go back to normal. Yeah, oh, interesting. But how do you adjust the exposure? You just, <laughs> you see, you just pull it down see, to this the. This is the problem when you, when you actually give it to a cameraman. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. There you go. Um, just, What's uh, the role of the producer, by the way? <laughs> there we go. Thank you. <laughs> Well, this has to be turned into 28. Wait, wait, don't turn that off. Don't turn that off. Please don't turn it off. 28? Seriously? No.